peace, still, quietness, rest. Those are terms that a person who knows the Lord Jesus understands in a way that a person without the Lord cannot possibly begin to comprehend. Genesis chapter 24 tonight. Genesis chapter 24. If you're wondering about my eye, I'm not contagious or infectious. I got sand in me in my eye last night, yesterday, playing with uh, volleyball with the kids. And um, it's been a hard day. <laughs> the eye pain is interesting because it just seems like it debilitates your your whole body. The light hurts so badly and it's uh, hard to focus and concentrate. But no matter. Genesis chapter 24. Genesis 24. Tony finally got Charlie here, so we're good to go now. <laughs> verse uh, 49, or verse 48, I bowed down my head and worshipped the Lord and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceedeth from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee, bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. And it came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, and he and the men that were with him, and tarried all night. And they rose up in the morning and said, Send me away. And he said, Send me away unto my master. And her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. After that she shall go. And he said, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. We'll pray. Father, help us as we look at your word tonight to glean truth from the scripture. And Lord, in a passage like this where there is uh, so much uh, record keeping and so much of just the story, help us to be careful not to go further than what your word says in giving account. But as we look at the faithfulness of this servant and as we look at the principles of a person who recognizes the hand of God in their life, Help us to glean from a principle so that we could do the same, so that we could know when your hand is in our lives and how to act and how, how to move. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name, asking for the moving of your spirit. Amen. Well, last week we looked at Abraham's stern command to his servant, and there were two, there were two major elements in the task that he sent his servant to do. First of all, he told his servant, he said, uh, we're... I, I want you to go back to my father's house, go back to my country, and I want you to find a wife because I do not want my son Isaac to marry a daughter of Canaan, the daughter of the Canaanites. Now keep in mind the importance of this as we've studied Genesis. Of course, we understand that there are two lines. There's a line of godliness. There's a line of men that seek after God. And there's a line of individuals that have rejected God's favor who have identified themselves with the curse of their fathers and with the uh, curse all the way back, really, to Cain. And uh, particularly in this instance, the curse would be back to Ham, who had dishonored his father. And so now Canaan is a cursed man, a cursed land. And now Abraham has been sent to do what his father who had left Ur, or who his father who had ended up in Ur of the Chaldees, but his father had set out to do that is to go to the land of Canaan. See, God told Canaan, your land's going to be given to another. You're going to be servants of another. And it was because of his identification with his father, uh, Ham's sin. Christian, understand and know that we must disassociate ourselves from the sins of our family. It's important that we break from sin. I've heard it preached before, you know, generational sin. And, and friend, I just want to tell you, uh, I'd be very discouraged if I believed that we could never have victory in our lives. The truth is that anyone can have victory through Jesus Christ. But when you come to Jesus Christ, my friend, you need to understand that there's a point when you break from what you came from. You break from the wickedness that is in your past, that's behind you. And Abraham has done that, and as he's in the land of Canaan, uh, he's, he has come there by faith, but he's in a wicked land among a wicked people. Literally, Lot's family and Lot himself has been destroyed 
in that land of Canaan because he's tried to align himself and associate himself with the Canaanites. Later on, we'll see Esau. We see uh, Ishmael marrying individuals that are from Canaan, and it destroys their family. It destroys their seed. It destroys them, keeps them from wanting to honor God. And Christian, as hard as it possibly can be, understand that your permanent family is more family than those folks that you'll be eternally separated from because they choose to rebel against God in heaven. Understand the importance of separation in the Christian life. Oh, you ought to love your family when you're saved. Your family ought to be the first people that you take the gospel to. If you love your family when you come to Jesus Christ, they're the first ones that you go to and you share the gospel and Christ's love uh, to. They're the people that you never stop sharing the gospel with. It's been wonderful. You know, as a little kid, there were a couple people in our family that weren't saved. And I remember as a child praying in particular for some of my family members. And uh, I have seen in the last 10 years, I've seen at least three or four of my family members who are up or in age uh, come to Jesus Christ. But friend, I want to uh, qualify that by saying they have not been the ones that I have been associating with. They're not the ones uh, that I have been aligning myself with. My desire is to align myself with brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And if your family will not go forward, friend, don't stay behind. Don't go to hell for anyone. I know people that I've shared the gospel with before that have said, I've seen, had husbands say, well, I don't want to receive Christ and be separated from my wife. I've seen wives say, I don't want to get saved because I'm afraid that it would create a separation between me and my husband. And I've seen children that were, uh, were concerned about being saved because they have deceased loved ones who they know are in hell. And friend, what does that mean ultimately when you take that logic all the way? Ultimately, it means I'd rather go to hell with the lost, those individuals who have rejected God, than I would uh, be to receive Jesus Christ and, have, and be separated from those individuals. Friend, hell is a place of separation. Can I remind you of that? You won't go to hell in fellowship with your friends and your family. You'll go to hell and be there in torment. But there's eternal darkness in hell, you see. And that eternal darkness is a place of weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And as terrible as it is that people are there, understand that every person who's ever gone there has gone there by their own choice of their own volition. And if you go there, it'll be for the same reason, and that is the most foolish choice in the world that any person could possibly make. And so Abraham, last week we saw, has told his uh, servant as he goes back to the land of his father, and he's going to look uh, actually to his, his, uh, his nephew, Abraham's nephew Laban, and his, his, uh, his brother's daughter. He's looking for a wife for his son Isaac. He sends him back into his country. And his servant asked the question. He said, okay, now, if she won't go, what do you do? Should I send Isaac back? Now, get this. Abraham said, under no circumstances, do not send my son back. All this time, moving forward to serve the Lord, Abraham said, never go back. Never go back to that land. Whatever you do, under no circumstance, let Isaac go back. Now think about this. This is very significant because for us it would be one thing, but for a man whose promise has been that his seed is going to be as the sand of the seashore, innumerable, you're not going to be able to count them. They're going to be like the stars in heaven. Now, what are you going to do if you don't get a wife? How can God honor it? See, many times we know God has called us to do something in life, and our question is, how can God do it if I don't? And Abraham understood that it was wrong for his servant to have a pragmatic approach to doing God's will. Abraham had already experienced that, you know. He'd already had a wife, uh, uh, or he'd already had a son with a woman who was not his legitimate wife. And it had wreaked havoc in his family, wreaked havoc in that woman's life, wreaked havoc in his son Ishmael's life. It wrecked and destroyed them, and it brought a terrible curse to his son Isaac because of his going back, because of his compromise. A Christian, never compromise when you want to do right and never go back. Never go back. Hey, if you could only get a snapshot of yourself in the misery, in the, in, in, in the drudgery, you know, when you're in complete bondage of sin, if you could just get that picture in your mind and fix it in your mind and just remember what it was like where you came from. And I can imagine Abraham saying, yes, my father was wealthy. Yes, we had a lot of things, but it was a wicked place. It was not where God had called me to, and I don't want my family ever to go back there. You know, too many times Christians, they, they keep in their mind a memory of the place that they were saved from, the place they came from, and they go back. Friend, never go back. And so his servant's second follow-through question to Abraham was, well, then should I just try to find Isaac, a good wife from the Canaanites? And Abraham said, under no circumstances, let my wife marry a cursed woman. Under no circumstances. He didn't put it that way. What? 
Did I say, oh, I said wife? My, yeah, that would be a real problem. <laughs> it's my eye. My eye is affecting me. If thine eye be single, thy body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be not single, anyway, whatever. All right, so now here we are in, cha in Genesis chapter 24. <laughs> it is hard to see, believe it or not. It's amazing how when one eye is swollen up and you can't keep it open, it's amazing how the other one doesn't work right. They're sympathetic. Your eyes are. So anyway, um, verse 46. Rebecca has come to the well where this servant of God is. And we know the story, I hope, I think where this beautiful young lady who is a virgin, who is a very pure young woman, has gone down to the well. And, and, and the servant of Abraham has just prayed, and he's just asked God in verse 14 of Genesis 24. He says, um, Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, it's verse 12, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. And he just made, he had a prayer that send me out the person that you want me to meet to draw uh, the water. And here, right when he's finished praying, Rebecca comes out and she happens to be uh, the, she happens to be, let's see, she would be the niece of Abraham. And back in those days, that would have been a legitimate thing uh, for them to, to uh, be married. And she comes out and uh, she's just a sweet young lady and she offers to him that her family, her home, has plenty of room to lodge strangers. And so come on home with us, and they go home. And Abraham's servant that night, right away, just proposes marriage for Rebecca. And it's interesting, though. Um, it's interesting. We think, well, you know, this is just an arranged marriage. Well, it's interesting how much Rebecca's uh, personal desires factored in. It's interesting how much Laban's uh, desires factored. Uh, where it's just really for the best of his sister and his father. And so uh, his, the servant has requested, he's made the request, of course, understand that, that Abraham was not a stranger to this family. Matter of fact, Abraham to this family was a man of great honor. Because you see, Abraham's father had left and he was on his way to Canaan, never made it there. But Abraham's the son that went and finished the job. He's the one that went. He left and got out of his father's house. And those in his father's house weren't left with a bad taste. And there wasn't a quarrel between Abraham and them. No, they knew that God had promised great things for Abraham. And so I want to just point out a couple of things tonight in Genesis 24 and, the, and toward uh, down look at, at verse, um, in verse uh, uh, 50. Uh, we, I want to just look at the response of this family of Rebekah to this proposal to take their daughter uh, uh, just a world away where they will never see her again and a response of them to asking her to do something which is of the Lord, which is for the Lord. Verse 50, Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. They said, We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Now, what does that mean? Well, see, the truth is, Laban and Bethuel, uh, Rebekah's father, understand that it is not their desire that their sister move away to another country where they'll never see her again. Their desire, their heart's desire, is not that God would take their daughter and do something with her that would uh, cause them to be at loss with regard to their relationship with her. You know, parents, it's astounding how oftentimes uh, children that have God's hand in their lives are held by family members who are not willing to turn loose of them. I've seen parents, and I know it's true, I've seen parents see their kids begin to grow in youth group and actually hold them back spiritually because they're afraid that there's going to create a separation in their life because of their child growing spiritually. I remember uh, my first year in youth ministry working with teenagers, and I had a young man and had a lot of trouble in his home, a lot of trouble with his family and so forth. Is in our youth group and um, and God was beginning to work in his heart. He was beginning to have a tender heart and end up living next door to their family. So I was able to see him a lot and able to talk to him a lot. And um, he came to me one time. God was really dealing with his heart about several things. He was, it had been very worldly. Their family was very worldly. And um, he came and asked me a question. He said, Pastor Price, he said, you know, I'm trying to figure out what's right in music. I'm trying to figure out what's right in music. And he said, I don't, know, I don't know if I should listen to my music or not. I didn't. Uh, let me take just a, just a second. <laughs> my son. Is... Sorry about that. Uh, 
So he didn't know whether his music was, was pleasing God or not, so I just shared with him some principles about separation. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You know that pretty much settles it for any kind of music if you just want to be honest with God. And uh, just some fellowship verses about fellowship with God, fellowship with light, fellowship with darkness. And I didn't say a word about his music. Matter of fact, <laughs> I was enough out of it, even at that age, that I, if he told me what his music was, I wouldn't have known what it was anyway. Don't try to stay current with the world's trends because you just can't. You can't keep up with it all. And there's no point in it anyway. Why do you need to know what the world does? You need to know what righteousness is. So this boy went home and he told his parents, he said, we're listening to bad music. <laughs> We're listening to bad music. Man, his dad was at my house within the hour. <laughs> and he came over and he said, you tell my son that we listen to bad music? And I said, no, I didn't. <laughs> and he said, he said, what'd you tell him? He came home and he said that we need to get rid of all of our music. And we need to stop listening to the stuff we're listening to. He said, I don't think there's anything wrong with the Beach Boys. I don't think there's any wrong, anything wrong with it. He started going down the list. Now, I knew who the Beach Boys were. <laughs> and so I just gave him some lyrics from them, some of the songs. And I said, well... Uh, I, I, it's funny. I don't think I know who the, I don't know the lyrics of the Beach Boys songs anymore. That's my dad's generation, anyway. Brother Chuck could probably tell you the lyrics if you need to know them. I don't know. <laughs> I can't see your face, Brother Chuck, so I don't know if you responded yes or no. But anyway, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, but he 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 told me. He says, you know, you need to stop teaching my son this. And he pulled him out of the youth group. Stop coming to church over that. It was interesting. I told him. I said, I never said a thing about your music to your son. He said it on his own. He determined on his own. And you know what? That, that, that boy, that poor young man is, is floundering today. He's hurt spiritually. And I've seen that kind of thing happen many times where a child has responded to God's Spirit moving in their hearts. And parents, because they're afraid it's going to affect them, will hold their children back. Will hold their children back. And I love the example of Laban and his father here as their response is, we don't really have much to say about this because it's of God. We can't really say much about it because it's of God. Now let me ask you, what kind of a parent are you? Hey, you may not agree with it because it, it kind of rankles you that your children are going to be different than you are, that they're going to take a step that you've never even considered in your life. But friend, what is it when something is of the Lord in the lives of your children? What's your desire for your children? Hey, whose hands are your children in better? Uh, or are they safer in yours or God's? How many parents are afraid if their children surrender to music, to music, to missions, that God's going to send them overseas or to a strange place? I remember my grandfather before, uh, uh, just a couple of years uh, before I graduated from college and just talking to me and saying, well, couldn't you do ministry in Kansas? Isn't there anything in Kansas that you could do to serve God? And uh, he wanted me at home. But I remember my grandfather being at my ordination. And a matter of fact, one of the last great memories we had was my grandfather staying in our house in Delray Beach and almost wanting to stay for a couple of months because he enjoyed himself so much in our ministry and, and uh, just being, uh, being around and, and seeing us serving the Lord. And my grandfather was willing to say like, like Laban, to say, hey, you know what? If my son's got to move away and I'll get to see him anymore, the thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak of any bad or good. Then in verse 55... The Bible says, and her brother and her mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at least ten. After that, she shall go. Now, uh, this servant was smarter than Jacob. I just I find this ironic. Here we got Laban <laughs> and his father saying, Hey, stick around a few years. <laughs> really, in just ten days. But we know how ten days went for Jacob, right? Well, uh, just a couple years, seven years, seven more years, seven more years. And uh, if, if Laban had had his way, they just stayed around forever. And they would have never gone back into the land of promise. Well, they asked the question, let her abide with us a few days. And I'm not saying they weren't sincere about this. After that, she shall go. And he said unto them, hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Now, here's the second principle I want us to see tonight, Christian. When God showed you something, it's time to start moving. When God has showed you something, it is time to start moving. How many of us have had God place on our heart ministry... And then we sit and we wait a few days. You know, the folks who wait a few days never go. Folks who wait a few days wait a whole lifetime and they've never served God. They've never done, done what God has showed them because they wait. And this servant said, hey, you said it's of the Lord. 
I know it's of the Lord. What's there to wait for? What's there to wait for? He said, hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Hey, Christian, when God calls you, He wants you to respond now. If God calls you now, now is when He wants you to respond. What's this thing about having to wrestle? What's this thing about having to wait on the Lord? When God has laid a thing on your heart and you know it, go. Now, I know, folks, boy, they don't know how to know the Lord's will. And they're the kind of people that go before they know that God has laid something on their heart. But Laban knew it. His father knew it. And so their response was, well, let's just wait a couple of days. And his servant's response is, what's there to wait for? What's there to wait for? Well, you know, uh, you know, it's going to be a long time, so we'll probably never see our, our sister again. Well, what is never seeing her again 10 days from now any different from never seeing her again tomorrow? It's a good question. See, we want to hold on, don't we? We want to hold on to the world. We want to hold on to the things that keep us from doing the Lord's will. We want to stay the way that we are just a little bit longer. And friend, when we do that, we, we, our response is to hinder, hinder others and to hinder ourselves from doing the Lord's will. And listen to their response. He said, send me away that I may go to my master. Verse 57, he said, we will call the damsel. They said, we will call the damsel and quiet at her mouth. And they called Rebecca and said unto her, will thou go with this man? And she said, I'll go. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? She said, I will go. And they blessed Rebekah, verse 60, and said unto her, Thou art our sister. Be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. It was several thousand years ago that Rebekah made a decision that she was going to go. But God's gone, done a lot with Rebekah since then, hasn't he? He's done a lot with the descendants of Rebekah since then, hasn't he? Friend, the hypothetical is in... in, in uh, is fortunately the good thing this time. The what would have happened is not what would have happened if she'd done right. The question is what would have happened if she'd done wrong. Well, we know God would have worked somewhere else in another way because God's always able to. But praise the Lord that Rebecca got to be part of God's work. And I just want to challenge you this evening. I want to challenge you to be the kind of people that don't let, don't let family or friends or things hold you back from the Lord's will. Uh, don't wait when God has already showed you that it's of the Lord. Well, you know it's of the Lord, friend. It's time to move. You say, Pastor, well, what, how would you take care of things? You know, who, who are going to be Rebecca's friends? What, it, what is going to happen to her in the future? Well, they sent her nurse along. <laughs> the truth is, is that her whole life was unknowns. It was all unknowns. The only thing she knew was it was of the Lord. And I'll submit to you this evening, that's enough. That's enough. That was enough for her. That's enough for you because the same God that we serve. Let's pray. Father, help us to mind your word. Help us to remember that if it's of the Lord, then, Lord, that we have no call to hinder anything that's of you. And then, Father, help us not to wait if it's of you. Help us to be willing to just, just go ahead and set out to serve you when you've called us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Work in the lives of individuals here tonight. Father, help us to desire to have your plan, your will in our lives, even if it means separation from those things that we love and are so familiar with. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.